Uh, good evening, everybody. Hope everybody can hear me. Let me just double check that I'm on the right microphone. I am. I am on the right microphone. All right. Well, excited to be here. Just want to check in with everybody. It's been a while. Uh, I know we didn't do Cashflow Chronicles last week, so hopefully we'll be able to do so this week. Uh, I'll have to chat with Hot Chris about that one. Um, but things are going well in the markets. Uh, let's just have a quick chat about where we are in the market. So March 17, 2024, NVIDIA, 881 Dutch Bros, oh, just under 34 bucks. Apple retracing, 172. Spy also retracing, down to under 5,100. Palantir, back below $25, 2350 bucks. Google. Google is $141 more than everybody said it was going to be three weeks ago. Everyone said it was going to zero. It's at 141 bucks. Uh, let's see which ones did I mix. The Qs, 434. Uh, we had Google there. Amazon is about a buck 74 right now. Bitcoin took a little bit of a tumble over the weekend and it is back up to 68,000. Excited to see where that ends up. But WTI back into the 80s for those folks that are watching. Those of you that watch Brent, you know that it's been in the 80s for quite some time. And Henry held gas pulling back a little bit. Um, so it is what it is, but today, uh, I actually had something set up earlier and, um, surprise, surprise, we're looking to potentially do some more real estate purchases. Uh, so unfortunately I didn't get to make, uh, a quick movie for you guys, but, uh, what I did want to cover today and I might make a finer detail sort of video about, is I made a tweet the other day about my top seven positions. So uh, from here, let's just take an opportunity to go through what my current top seven positions are for individual stock positions. I'll say that again, individual stock positions. I have many more ETFs and holdings that are not on this list. These are the individual stock holdings that I do hold um, in the portfolio. So first and foremost, let me do some some Sharon. Let me get rid of this house that we're looking at here. Um, let me pull up the screen. And then once we get done with that, we can hang out. Let's chat. Let's talk about some things that are going on in this beautiful, beautiful world. Um, yes, this is the one I want to share. Let me just double check that there's nothing on here. Proprietary. No. All right. So we should be good to just chit chat a little bit about what what my top seven individual stock positions are. Now, as I alluded to, this doesn't include the SP 500, doesn't include some of the other ETFs. Otherwise, this list would change. But as you probably would expect, my top position is Palantir, just based off the fact that it's increased pretty substantially, up over 40, almost 40% year to date, almost 200% over the past year. So I have a decent position within Palantir, so that's been something I've continued to add to over the past several months uh, and years. So nice to see that um, that that is uh, that is where it is. Uh, let me just double check that I'm not uh, on. All right, I'm not in any voice chats on Discord, so that's good. <laughs> so. That is that's Palantir, and I'm I'm bullish on this one. You know, this one I don't feel like I need to dedicate nearly as much time to whether that's posting videos. Or something. There's so many other content creators that do such a good job, like Arnie, Amit, um, Vince is bullish, does a good job. There's a lot of people that are adding to the Palantir content now, where I feel like it's truly gotten to a league of its own, where it doesn't need my support, right? And even still, my support. Yes, I use the product. Um, you know, I use Foundry on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, it seems like I can't keep up with the amount of um, news that the company itself is able to put out. And uh, with that, you know, it's probably better that most people like follow a, an emit or, or somebody like that um, when it comes to sort of Palantir news. I think he does a really good job of it. So uh, I don't think you need any any help or anybody needs any help with respect to that, I'll still chime in and, and give my kind of experiences when it comes to utilizing the product um, because I do have that foundry experience that I can bring. But overall, you know, I'm not rushing to, to make Palantir content because there's already such a good 
league of folks that uh, that do such a good job of it. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, the second one, uh, unfortunately, I can't dive too much into um, due to the fact that it's based off of share-based compensation. We generally don't talk about this one on the channel too much, and that's UDOC. So you can look up ticker symbol UDOC as much as you want. You won't find anything. But that stands for Undisclosed Oil Company. I think anybody that's been here around long enough can probably figure it out. And there's been enough slip-ups at this point that people could probably figure it out as well. Um, and I talk about a lot of other companies, but I don't talk about this one so much. So I'm sure, you, uh, you know, if you guys are really interested. But based off of just being in the company, you get a little bit of share-based competition. You get a little bit of love with that um, over the years. So you're able to, to stack a, a little bit of a, a size position there and so um it doesn't run as much as pound tier so if it did it would definitely be number one but uh the the company udoc does not run nearly as much as pound tier does and so unfortunately for me uh it is only a number two i wish i could see it uh it go high and, and fast above what pound tier does so uh there is that one uh moving over to this company, which is the third on the list, it is Amazon. So Amazon is probably about 20 to 25% behind in terms of portfolio size or position size of UDOC uh, and probably 30 to 40% less than pound here at this point. And so um, that's um, th it's a good position, man. I think a lot of people still think of it as a uh, you know a small cloud provider that doesn't necessarily not small I guess but a cloud provider that doesn't necessarily make too much money and these guys man I'm telling you um, these guys will make I I have a very strong feeling these guys will make a trillion dollars in revenue and if you think about that from that perspective the amount that you can get even with a small amount of gross margin um is is huge one percent gross margin on a on a trillion dollar revenue is ten billion dollars and we've seen just very simply what it can look like from a from an operating income perspective over the past few quarters with respect to amazon and them really focusing on efficiency rather than specifically growing the business and what that's done to their bottom line and it's been absolutely phenomenal to watch as a company um, I made the prudent decision back in the late 2022 time frame to add. Unfortunately, I added a lot in this time period as well, 2020, 2021, because I just anticipated that growth trajectory was going to continue. Uh, and I knew I was overpaying at the time, but, um, you know, I thought, why, why not? You know, I think it's going to be something that continues to do really, really well going into the future. And so, um, unfortunately for me, uh, it did take this tumble, but during that tumble, I was able to add a lot uh, of it. So with that, you know, I can't complain all too much because with it, you know, I've been able to acquire more and more and more. And now I'm close to um, my goals. You know, I'm not nearly to the extent that I want to be in terms of ownership of it. Uh, I would love to have probably double the amount of shares, I would say. Um, but you know, I'm happy with with where it's at, um, and and I can't complain with that. I honestly think that this will be a five trillion dollar company here in the not too distant future. It's about one point eight right now, so I'm fully confident that it'll triple in size. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with continued growth in AWS, continued growth internationally, continued growth as well domestically in the United States in terms of e-commerce. And so I'm happy that this is a, a third large position. I guess my biggest fear is, is like, and this is a lesson for all of you guys, 10 years ago, if you asked me if I would invest in a company like Amazon, I would have told you, hell no. Hell no, I'll never invest in a company like Amazon. Why? Oh, it doesn't have a price to earnings. It doesn't. And that's just because, you know, when you're so young and you're just getting involved in some of these things, you get smart enough to be dangerous, but not smart enough to realize when you don't know anything. And then the more you know, the more you realize you don't know a lot. Um, and so I've gotten to the place now where I'm like, 
in retrospect, I was really dumb and stupid and didn't really know exactly what I was talking about. I knew enough where I was like, oh, price to earnings. But it's like you can't compare a price to earnings from an oil company to an Amazon or to a Tesla or, you know, any of these sort of companies. They vary. They differ. The key performance indicators or KPIs differ between industry to industry as well. What's important for one isn't necessarily important for the other. <clears throat> like monthly active, monthly active users is not important for Union Pacific, the railroad company, but it's immensely important for a Facebook. Um, and just like cost per tonnage probably isn't that, uh, or operating cost per tonnage probably isn't that very much of importance to Facebook considering they're mostly digital assets, but it's extremely important to a Union Pacific. So, uh, you know, it, it gives you some food for thought as to what's really important for different businesses. And, um, yeah, just kind of keep keep your eye on that. Um, just a quick check-in. Uh, we got a good amount of folks just kind of hanging in here, um, just 30 or so of you on, on YouTube. So I appreciate you guys hanging in. Um, we're going through the top seven individual positions in the portfolio right now. So if you're kind of curious what the heck we're talking about, that's what we're going through. Uh, the fourth largest position is actually Bitcoin, or some people call it Buckcorn. Um, it really just depends on who you're talking to. Uh, the past year has been pretty good for the rally. Uh, we've seen it go from about 29, 30,000 uh, to doubling, uh, almost uh, going up 150% since that point. Now, I don't have so much Bitcoin. Uh, I think all of crypto, my kind of non retirement accounts, I guess you could say. It's about 7% of what my net worth is, excluding my retirement accounts. If you were to include it, it's probably closer to 5 or so percent of all my accounts. Uh, and that 7% is inclusive of Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ethereum Classic. I do have some smaller shit coins in there as well. Excuse my language, but it's the truth. And, uh, you know, just those some of those things are mostly for gambles. But I think the thing that I do have the most trust in from a crypto perspective is my Bitcoin and Ethereum. and you know, I've, I've seen um, an opportunity with uh, with this for a lot of people to join in. And, uh, you know, I don't recommend putting, like, let's say your whole life savings into it. But I do fully firmly believe that Bitcoin, I agree with Tom. Um, crap. What's his name? The guy from Fundstrat, Tom Lee. I do agree with him. 150,000 is probably where we're going as a firm foundation. For 2025, I think we'll probably end up in the 180 to 220 sort of range for Bitcoin before it eventually comes back down in the second half of 2026, back down to the $50,000, $60,000 range. Um, so I think that's just inevitable. I think it's going to happen. It's what happens with every cycle. <clears throat> so there's that piece. Uh, I think you know Bitcoin as a whole will, will do pretty well. Uh, I'm still trying to decide how I'm going to maneuver this one. I thought I would wait until buying another property. And here we are talking about buying another property already. Um, so we'll see what ends up happening. You know, if, if that's the case, uh, I probably won't sell too much, uh, Bitcoin when it gets to the peak, I might just wait to add, um, instead of selling out. The thing that bothers me a little bit is I have about half of my Bitcoin in actual physical, Bitcoin that I have in my own. And then I also have uh, just for liquidity pieces, just so I can kind of keep track of it, like the other half of my Bitcoin in uh, GBTC or Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. Now, some of you guys are saying, Matt, you're an idiot. Well, Matty bought that in 2020. He didn't just jump in when all these other nine spot ETFs came in to the business. So that was really the only spot ETF for Bitcoin ETF that was out there it wasn't even a spot ETF at the moment because there was a difference within the net asset value and what, what it was actually trading at, which you could actually do some arbitrage uh, back then, which was actually kind of cool. And I did that actually with one of the grayscale digital large caps. <clears throat> the premium was at one point over like 150% compared to um, what the actual asset value was. And so I, uh, I sold it and put that back into the Bitcoin because at the time it was kind of trading at par. So it was really interesting um, when that kind of happened. So I, I took that opportunity to to kind of arbitrage a little bit. But so you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. You have 450% return in GBTC right now. 
you can't just sell that and immediately put it into, say, an IBIT or or one of these other ETFs. It's like, yes, you'll be shaving, saving a little bit or shaving off some of that expense ratio, but you know, you, you impact long-term capital gains on a pretty good return, right? So the majority of that value now um, at, at a 450% return is return. So you'd probably pay 10, 15% of whatever I sold and immediately pay that to the government. Uh, you know, whereas my anticipation is that grayscale over time will likely decrease their expense ratios um, when things kind of get to where they're at. Um, so as you can see, this is just a little small amount of here that I've just have a 0.1 on here. So it's um, nothing too crazy. It's only 170%, but I do have some in grayscale and that's <clears throat> probably where the majority of my um, I would say the majority of the concentrated allocation is is in grayscale, GBTC. Here's 0.1. I have another 0.1 or something on Coinbase, and I got some others in my actual wallets that I hold in cold storage too. So um, this is just so I can keep track. And <clears throat> I add about 50 bucks every couple of weeks to this. So uh, it's been fun. Um, been able to, to just add a little bit of pocket change here and there for, for Bitcoin and done really well. This is another one that's returned really well um, and you know, bought at a decently opportune time. Unfortunately, the ticker symbol has changed, so you can't really see the, the long-term performance of this, but this used to be Royal Dutch Shell or RDS. Now it's trading under ticker symbol S-H-E-L uh, for Shell. And uh, I bought a lot of this during the pandemic, um, and I, I believe in the company. I partner a lot with the company. They do a lot of good work with us. And uh, that being said, I think that they are pretty prudent in staying keen on uh, on a, a, a appeasing shareholders um, and thinking long-term when it comes to the energy transition and also just ensuring that there's a balance between their own oil and gas operations as well. They're not going to haphazardly cut or make inappropriate decisions. And so... I think these guys will be a good one holding, but at the same time, I could see a spot where <clears throat> I sell this and just move it to the S&P 500 <clears throat> because not to say that Shell is in a bad position here. I just don't see them doubling. You know, they, they've they kind of, if you were able to kind of zoom out, they've kind of been the 250 uh, billion market cap range before. So that would mean probably a 20, 25% increase from here. But they're never really going to be a $300, $400 billion company unless that's due to inflation and the value of the dollar goes down pretty substantially. So to me, it's better to probably just put the money at this point now that you're getting kind of close to a peak into a SPY. Now, they do pay a really good dividend and they do do some share buybacks. But um, you could see, I mean, just with oil prices, it's continued to kind of go up and to the right, even throughout 2022. If you guys remember what happened throughout 2022, there was inflated oil prices. So now we're kind of back down to the $80 a barrel range comparatively to over 100 uh, during 2022, and the price has kind of gone up. So premiums for oil and gas companies are getting kind of full in this respect. I mean, if we do, we're kind of at a pivot point as well. We're seeing a lot of cuts from OPEC. We're seeing a lot of um, people kind of really trying to maximize their efficiency from a capital efficiency standpoint and <clears throat> focusing on share buybacks rather than loosely reinvesting back into the business, which would cause, you know, industry inflation amongst other things, um, put them in more poor uh, financial conditions as a, as a company, et cetera. And you're seeing give a lot more to share buybacks as well. So you kind of have a, a dual thing kind of going on. You have all these cuts coming from OPEC coupled with underinvestment. Um, so it's kind of like a, where is it actually going to lie? You know, where, where, where are we going to actually head to? Um, is there going to be some sort of um, global political environment where oil prices get, you know, skyrocket? Um, or is it going to be that the fact that people over invest, you know, we're at a pretty good stable point right now where even though we're pulling back in the United States, for example, on total rig count, we're actually able to keep production flat at about 13 million barrels per day. Um, and that being said, it's then forcing OPEC to cut, you know, 500,000 barrels a day here, a million barrels a day there, 
just to kind of put a floor on the price of, of oil. So um, like we stated, oil prices are back in the $80 range, but um, if they go into the $50, $60 range, I'm sure there's going to be a little bit more turmoil. Um, if that's the case, you know, I, I would potentially look at the opportunity to pick up more Shell or any other company that maybe pulls back on that. But it's kind of like you're fully valued right now. Um, oil price has kind of come down to the $80, $70, $80 range, but yet these oil company valuations have continued to go up and to the right throughout that time period. Let's just take a quick another look at, say, ExxonMobil, for example. It's like 2021, 2022, um, that's when oil prices were above 100. Now we hear we are just at about 80 bucks, and you know the price of the company is almost at its all-time highs um, in in recent times. Right, you're almost at 450 billion dollars. So it gets you to kind of sit there and think a little bit. Um, is is this the right time to be sitting in these companies? You know, buy low, sell high. You're kind of at the I don't want to say peak of a cycle, but you're well valued. The prices have kind of been fully, um, fully valued at this point over the past year or so. Um, is it is it right to continue, or is it better to just trim that opportunity and uh, and put that in the S P five hundred? And I'm up a hundred percent on the entirety of the the position. You know, during the pandemic, I added substantially, and uh, with dividends reinvested, I'm up over a hundred percent. So. You know, do you just take your money? Do I see it going up another 50 to 100%? I find it very tough. You know, could it jump to the $70 range? It could, you know, it could, it could do that. Um, and it was in that range in 2018 time period before the pandemic. But, you know, going from 65 to 70 doesn't really make me feel good. When I know for good certainty that the spy is going to go to from 5,000 it is today or the 500 it is today to 800 or 900 in the coming years, right? I mean, I'm not talking about tomorrow, but I'm talking five years down the road, SPY's going to be at 800 or 900, regardless of whatever you guys think. Um, so there's that. That's the that's the fourth position, or maybe that's the fifth, fifth position in the top seven that I kind of want to allude to. And then here's the company that should be at zero. Uh, if you ask anybody that's in the audience, you know, two, three weeks ago, they thought, you know, this was going to trail off. And here we are at 140 bucks a share. Um, so I think I think things have kind of come forthright uh, with this one. Um, I don't know if that's the right term, but up uh, uh, about 2% to date in the past year, 47% up. Uh, I think this one, I'm up a pretty decent margin on this one. Now, I didn't buy as much of this in 2020, 2021. Um, 2022, but I did buy a decent amount in 2019 to 2020. So uh, I think my cost basis is below 100 bucks. So I'm up about 40, 45% overall in this position. And I believe this is another one that's going to be a $5 trillion company. I don't think people are giving enough credit to the Google Cloud platform and uh, where that's going to be heading from a from a profitability perspective going in. And, and so it's growing at a pretty decent pace. It's 25% for the past few quarters. And if you just keep adding to that at the net margins that they're going to be observing going forward, it's going to be a, it's going to be a powerhouse. It's going to be moving pretty quick. Um, reminiscent of what you saw to my Microsoft SharePoint or not Microsoft SharePoint, Microsoft share price. In the 2015 time period, I have a feeling, um, really, really started to skyrocket. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that Azure came to save the day for them uh, at Microsoft. I feel like GCP will come to save the day and really explode the revenues. And not even that, but you're seeing double digit revenues in YouTube. You're seeing YouTube premium sell like hotcakes as well. So you're seeing a lot of these side things that everyone's kind of saying, oh, search is dead, search is dead. And it's putting a drag on the stock price because this is, if you were to evaluate it comparatively to the other Magnificent Seven, excluding maybe Tesla, um, this is the cheapest. You know, I wrote an article about this one on Seeking Alpha about the drag on the stock that everyone's kind of observing right now, um, specifically around, you know, the price to earnings. And to me, I, I could easily see this. I forget what I put on Seeking Alpha. Um, let me just double check it really quick. Uh, what did I put? 
for my seeking alpha post, I put do 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 do. Where's my posts, my guy? Profile. Uh, analysis, Google. You guys can see this, yeah? Um, so this is what I put on here. Um, I have less than 100, or no, I have, never mind. I almost have 200 people. You should follow me on Seeking Alpha if you don't. I thought this was going to... It's a pretty good article. You guys should read it if you haven't. Put some time into it. Uh, 185 to 190 is where I kind of thought it would be um, at the end of 2025. So the next 22 months or so. And that's a lot higher than what our friends have at uh, on the street, if if you will. So I'm just confident that we'll be able to buy back some more stock. I'm confident that We'll be able to, to continue to grow. Google Cloud will do really, really well, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then last but not least on the top uh, seven, and this one actually will be borderline um, increasing above Google. So I have about 4,000 shares right now where I sold puts at five bucks to get like a 60 or 70 cent premium. Um so technically I'm underwater on those because obviously that would mean I need to like $4 and 40 cents or $4 and 30 cents for it to break even. But I'm happy because I was able to collect that, you know, whatever it was, 50, 60, 70 cents. I don't remember. I've rolled it a couple of times and being able to capture an extra nickel here, dime there. Um, but it's not really important. The share price of $4 and $5 is the same to me. Um, you know, I'm just going to be blunt. Yeah. You might be able to, um, capture 20% more shares uh, if you were to say buy it at four bucks than five bucks. But at the end of the day, buying shares is buying shares, and that's the most important piece. And you guys might be sitting there and being like, well, there's a math. There's a, you know, you're good at math. You're an engineer. There's a difference between four to five bucks. To me, just guaranteeing that you get the shares in your portfolio before what happens over the next five years is going to be what's most important. Um, you know, you can bicker about a price difference of 20%. But if that's going to cause you to not buy the stock, you know, I'm going to buy the stock at five. I'm going to buy the stock at four, right? I, I don't, there's no discrepancy between that for me. Maybe there is for you and, you know, that's okay. I'm not going to tell you what's, what's comfortable for you. You know, you got to do your own due diligence, risk tolerance. It's personal finance after all. To me, you know, this one is going to be the one, you know, Palantir is the first company I ever had that was a six-figure position, um, individual stock position, I mean. You know, I just want to clarify that. I've had, you know, SPY and, and a couple other ETFs be over 100,000 for me before. I'm very confident that once I get my share count, uh, it's at 9,100-ish now for Rocket Lab. Um, it's going to grow to, I think, close to 13, 13,100. I'd like to get it to 15. Um, if I can find some money, uh, I was thinking about uh, with this uh, recent influx of cash that I just received and increasing this closer to 15, because by the end of next week, I'll, I'll get put those 4,000 shares of, of Rocket Lab at five bucks. Um, but with that said, uh, I was hoping to kind of get it closer to 15. Does not look like it'll get there. Uh, if this inf if if I end up buying this real estate deal, um, if I don't, then I'll have some money on the side, but uh, to be able to potentially increase the the Rocket Lab to to fifteen thousand shares. But uh, for now, it'll kind of stick at the ninety one hundred. By the end of this week, it'll be close to thirteen thousand one hundred. Um, and then who knows? I'm hoping to get it to fifteen, but this might actually beat out Google here uh, once I get those additional 4,000 shares or if the stock price just goes back to five bucks, you know, it'll, you know, and I get those 4,000 shares, it'll definitely uh, outpace Google. And you think about it, this thing can move very quickly. So if you, if you're doing the math, you know, 9,100 shares, it's about 40 grand, give or take, um, you know, say I do get that additional 
4,000 shares. Yeah. Um, I'm not very good at math. So let me just pull up a calculator really quick and do it on the side here. So 13,000 times 4.18, that's about 55,000. All it takes is this stock going to about $10, um, even just $8.50. And this will easily become my first uh, individual stock position in the portfolio, outpacing even Palantir. So uh, there's a rule of, of share count in that respect that, you know, if you think about it, once you have 13,000 shares, every time the price goes up 10 cents, you're going up a pretty good chunk of change. You're going up, you know, $1,000, uh, $1,300 to be exact. You go up a dollar, you know, and you have 13,000 shares, you're going up 13 grand. So um, it, things move very quickly, just like they did for Palantir. Palantir was hanging out in the 50, $40,000, $50,000 range not too long ago in terms of total size in the portfolio. And here you grow, you know, pretty quickly, you know, 100, 150% in the matter of a year. And it's over six figures. So, you know, this one, this one's going to be a long term hold, you know. Um, I do see potential for this to to drag a little bit. I do see potential for uh, this to, to kind of linger for the next 12 months until they get Neutron all settled, their medium launch vehicle that's supposed to compete with the Falcon 9. Uh, but the company is doing the right thing. You know, they're, they're on pace for their fourth launch uh, this month. Um, in the first, sorry, their fourth launch this quarter at the end of this month. So I think sometime this week, I think it's supposed to be Thursday time frame now, um, Wednesday, Thursday time frame now, that they launch another vessel um, for them, which that'll be fourth and a quarter. I think that ties their record for them. They were supposed to do five, but they had some delays of some other folks. So that being stated, I mean, once they're there, they, they're they pretty much close to 20% of their goal for the year. So their goal is to launch 22 vessels. Um, so the hope is, is you know, they'll, they'll be four out of 22. So they'll be um, just under, you know, a fifth of the way there at that point. And they are able to get a fifth one in, a fifth and sixth one in in April. They'll be on good pace uh, at that point to, to kind of get the 22 vessels that they were expecting for the year up into the air. And then coupling that with 1Q, I mean, 1Q, we'll find out at the beginning of May, so just a month and a half away. These guys are expecting to have $90, $95 million quarter which the best quarter that they've had in the past is like 70 million. So um, going from 70 to 90 million, increasing the run rate close to $400 million a year. That's, that's going to be exciting. Last year they closed in on 240 million, which I think was like a 15, 16% increase from, from 2022. Um, once again, you know, they had the delays associated with launch and stuff like that, but uh if, if they're able to accomplish their goals this year, they're get close to 400 million. And this company is only worth $2 billion at this point. Um, so the price to sales is closing in on five um, if they're able to accomplish their, their 2024 revenue goals. So I'm very confident in this one. Um, if you compare it to say a SpaceX, and I know SpaceX is the premier company, but uh, I have a good, hopefully a good conversation with Sachin later this week. And, We'll decipher what he, his thoughts are in Rocket Labs. So looking forward to that one. Uh, that will not be live um, just because I have some things I want to ask him personally. And then because um, we both work in oil and gas, so I want to ask him some some things. But um, I'm going to tailor it and probably, I don't know. I, 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 my thought is, is it's going to release in at least two sections, one about Rocket Lab, maybe some Palantir, maybe some other stuff. But if you guys are curious, you know, write DM me uh, some thoughts about what you want me to ask him. Um, because he's he's very unique to the Rocket Lab um, community, and uh, and I'll get into the reason why when I release that video. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, I think he has a unique perspective uh, because he doesn't invest just in Rocket Lab. I will say, and he doesn't just invest in Palantir either, right? So if you're reading between the lines, you know what I'm talking about. You'll be like, yes, that is a really good point. I haven't heard anybody speak from that perspective before. And I agree. I think it's very interesting. And I want to dive deep into that because I don't have that experience and I'm pretty experienced. And, and I think a lot of others do not have that experience either. Um, so I'd be very curious. So what his thoughts are. So with that, uh, let's just 
chit chat away with some folks. I'm glad we've been able to to garner uh, 40 or so people on YouTube and some others on X. So very excited. Let me move this over here so I can see a little bit better the chat. And we'll just run down, say hello to some friends. Appreciate everybody stopping by. I know I don't do these streams enough, but uh, glad to be here on a beautiful Beautiful Sunday evening before we kick off the work week. Uh, Juan Carlos, what's going on, my guy? Much appreciated for you stopping by. Dean Pierce, you're the man. Uh, thank you for all the love and support you're giving on Chris's Discord. It's nice to be there and hang out and see your face. Juan, again, buenos noches. Uh, talk about next. We talk about next a lot, my man. Um, I wish, part of me wishes um, that I could... Uh, put five grand into next, but we'll see what ends up happening with this house uh, that we're purchasing, the next beach house. It, it might put a, a wrench into things for the my NAXT investments. Uh, Garcia, becoming a trillionaire by selling pounds here and going all in on cat Wi-Fi hat. Cat with hat. Cat with hat? Garcia, you're the man, the myth, and the legend. I'm glad you're here, my friend, as always. Meta Mike, what's going on? My guy, good to see you again. Uh, on holdings, going to the moon. A lot of people jumping in on holdings. I looked at it a little bit with my boy, Uncle Tevi, um, and uh, couldn't get completely turned on. It didn't seem awful, though. So I'm not going to be um, not going to be hating on anybody that makes money with it. It just didn't seem like the home run that I wanted to take an investment on. Um, but hopefully it works out for all of you. Uh, Clyde, what's going on, my guy? Uh, Juan, thank you for the bros love. I actually just got uh, a starry something or other rebel. That's probably why I'm fired up. It's probably why I'm doing uh, a live stream right now. Uh, I'm going to retire on UDOC. Uh, maybe. Maybe. I did. I did. I did. Uh, I will be signing a contract to extend my time at UDOC. Um, it'll be good. It'll be a different position. It'll. I do a lot of portfolio management on my own personal time. I will now be doing more portfolio management, uh, we'll say. I can't say much more else. Um, that doesn't mean investor relations. Uh, Ken, all anyone needs to do is, is Google you and look at your LinkedIn. Yes, that's true. I'm not hiding people. I just, separation of church and state, right? Separation of church and state. That's all I need. I just need a little bit of separation. You know, I, I, my words that I speak on my YouTube are of my own, and I just don't need to be associated with my organization. I love you, Doc. Um, but I just try to keep a little bit of separation of church and state. But yes, anybody that's really that curious, I'm not hiding. Go find me on LinkedIn. Uh, many of you already have. So <laughs> I'm, I'm connected with a lot. I'm connected with Sacha. I'm connected with Amit. I'm connected with a lot of people on LinkedIn. So, um, Ice man, what is going on? Much appreciated for you stopping by. Uh, we got Hot Garcia, the man, the myth, the legend. Uh, will Apple give me Lambo in four years? Kind of looks beaten down by the FUD. Man, I've never been. Um, I think that there's better opportunities than Apple. I'm trying to understand. I mean, their margins are great, right? So I'm not. When I say there's better opportunities, it doesn't mean I'm shitting on Apple, right? Uh, and I've been wrong on Apple. I've been wrong on Tesla. You know, I'm just going to be putting it out there. I put my money into Google, Apple, sorry, Google, Amazon. And I wish I'd put my money in Apple, Tesla, Facebook, et cetera. You know, around the same time I was putting all my money into Amazon and Google, I should have been putting it into Meta because um, I was making the same investments, right? I didn't think Meta was bad. I just thought, you know, how long would it be beaten down for? And really it was only beaten down for six months. Um, and, and then it turned around so quick that everybody stopped hating on Zuckerberg, but these things come in motion right now, right? Like everybody doing the same thing with Google, you know, they come and go very quickly. You know, people like to, to jump on the bandwagon Apple. I'm not hundred percent certain what their next move is, but they're continuing to do really well with their margin expansion and, to be very honest, like if you want to look at Apple really quick, um, a really good view that you can do with like macro trends. Um, is it revenue? Let's look at revenue. I think that might be. Yeah, so 
revenue for these guys. Let me share here. Streamception. Uh, you can see for Apple on top, this is the trailing 12 months. Pretty much over the past, let's zoom down, over the past two years, revenue for Apple has been rather flat, right? Um, you can kind of see the quarter over quarter difference. Uh, the yearly quarter over quarter difference is kind of remaining flat-ish. Uh, but you can kind of see that by the stabilization here in the trailing 12-month yield uh, or revenue, rather. Uh, that's gross profit. Let's do net income. So how is net income favored? Well, net income of the, of the company has actually remained rather flat as well. Uh, if you think about it, it was at you know, the same time period, past two years, $100 billion or so, to now being about $100 billion. So it's remained rather flat. But if you look at the earnings per share, and this is what the stock is truly evaluated on, because you evaluate the stock price based off of how many shares of the stock there are. And if you look at it, it's actually increasing slowly. And the reason being is because they're buying back so many shares. So even though that the earnings has kind of remained rather flat, if you look at the shares outstanding over time, they continue to buy back a large amount of shares on a quarterly basis. So um, if you give them that sort of lens, then um, you know Apple will continue to do rather well. I just don't understand from their perspective, what are they going to continue to do? I mean, they don't have to do much. I mean, to be honest, they could just keep releasing iPhones. They could keep getting their net margins in a good spot. Um, you know, but in order for them to go to a $3 trillion company to a $4 trillion company, they need to do something, whether that's with, with the services, you know, that's one thing I never really um, could comprehend with Apple was their services business. Uh, so there could be, you know, tens of billions of dollars of net income there alone. Um, that obviously, if you add a 30 PE on that is billion, hundreds of billions of dollars, you know, $10 billion at a 30 PE is $300 billion. So, you know, it doesn't take much, uh, net income increases for Apple for you to, uh, get to a place where you start adding hundreds of billions of dollars in market cap. So just some thought there. Joe H., what's going on, my guy? Fool's gold. Appreciate you, my man. I do it all for you guys. I'm here to hang out with y'all. Love a surprise stream on a Sunday night. Me too, my man. Tim, good to see you. Uh, Boba the dog. Talk about Snowflake. I'm not well-versed on Snowflake. That's a Chris Patel special. Um, I'm more of a, a Palantir kind of guy. Uh, Francel, this is lame. I watched eight seconds. Still haven't become a trillionaire. Fraud. I agree. You should report me to the SEC. Uh, I will gladly be served. Uh, Mike, what is going on, my guy? Mr. Premium of the option, is Rocket Labs going to zero? 175%. Uh, can I sell shares of UDOC if you wanted, or are they locked up for a time period? Uh, the, they're still, a lot of my shares are still restricted at the moment. Uh, so I could sell naked options if I wanted. However, if that's the case and somebody executes them early, I'd kind of be screwed. So, uh, but yes, that's the plan. I have a decent amount um, maturing next year, uh, not maturing, but vesting next year. And I'll, I'll plan on writing some covered calls on those. Um, ETF FaceTime is waiting for my Airbnb course. Uh, so welcome ETF FaceTime. Keep waiting. My guy. Uh, Mr. Cold. All I hear is Lambo at eight bucks. Um, <laughs> Not enough. No, it's not enough for a Lambo. It's probably enough for another house, but I'll probably wait. Um, I think that that one will make me a half million bucks. I think I told you guys. Palantir is my first $100,000 position. Rocket Lab will be my first half a million dollar position. Uh, Adashir Jahanian. Hopefully I'm saying that right. One guess insights are the most interesting because that's both your domains. Yeah, Sachin knows what he's talking about, man. I, I would love to actually. Maybe that's something I could ask him about if he's looking at anything specific for oil and gas. But he does do consulting in oil and gas. So I'm curious what his restrictions are. I'm not restricted at the moment. That's a good question I need to ask with my, my potential new boss tomorrow. I'll be restricted from um, investing in any particular companies. So that's a good good question. 
Investment, what's going on, my yay? Uh, Pounds here all day. Day in the life. Welcome back to the stream. Ricardo, part of the money gig, 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 gang. Money gang. Much appreciated. Uh, as always, Ricardo, it's great seeing you. Always love seeing you in the chats. Just on the phones, who is coming to disrupt Apple? Um, yeah, that's a good way to put it. That's one way to think of it. Somewhat recurrent income in that department. I agree. It's kind of like Google search. You know what I mean? Like they're not. They're not hurting in that department, right? Uh, until somebody kind of knocks them off course. I don't see that really happening at the moment. We got hot decks. So glad that everyone's here. Uh, I'm curious, man. I'm really excited to be here. Really excited to share that top seven uh, positions with you guys. Guys, hopefully it was insightful. Uh, Curious, you know, there's there's a lot of things that I've been doing. Maddie Capital is doing rather well this year. Um, I just checked a few of my position or my uh, Fidelity accounts. Uh, maybe I'll do it on the side here really quick. Let's just double check that I'm not um, sharing any uh, proprietary data. But let's just do a quick look for myself where I am in terms of the annual year-to-date performance comparatively to the S&P. Um, and last I checked, I was up pretty good comparatively. I think well, some of them were up like 18% just year to date. Uh, so let's just see where I'm at. Sorry, I just two-factor authentication, right? So let's go into my individual account summary. Uh, the past day, I'm down more than everybody. But um individual account uh we are up 16 percent year to date pre-tax compared to the sp6 sorry seven and a half 7.6 percent over the past year we're up 90 percent a lot of that is likely palantir bitcoin um google amazon um probably being dragged down by rocket lab for sure sp is only up 34 ish percent and then the YouTube Moolah account, this one's fun because this one's rather new. We don't even have a year-long history date. Uh, but year-to-date in the YouTube Moolah portfolio, which is the one that Chris and I have as our public portfolio, it's about 22%. A lot of that's being dragged up by Celsius. And obviously the year-to-date on the SPY is 7.5%. Um, last one month on the public portfolio is 14% up versus 2% on the SPY. And I anticipate a lot of that is, is Celsius. Uh, my Roth, let's see here. Where'd it go? Here it is. It's hiding. Year to date. My Roth is only up 1% year to date. So I'm down compared to the market. So Roth is dragon. I think a lot of that's because I have Rocket Lab in there. I have a decent position of Rocket Lab and SLG. Uh, over the past year, though, I'm up 40% compared to the SPY's 34%. So um, almost even on that account. My traditional IRA, um, this one should be a little bit more fun. In the past year, I'm up 77, almost 78% compared to the 33 and a half for the SPY. Year to date, I'm up 18 versus seven and a half for the SPY. Uh, I thought it was better than that. And then 401k is just the SPY pretty much for me. So um, one year return is 28% for me because I think I do a little bit of, of cash uh, as well, which drags drags on the performance a little bit for the 401k but overall most of my portfolio outperforming um comparatively to to everybody else uh let's see um so we got 47 of you guys in here i haven't seen any new comments in a minute uh let's just do a quick rustle off of uh q a and then i don't know about you guys but i've been playing hell divers a lot um not a lot but you know i'm level five so I would like to do one or two Hell Divers missions before I hit the sack and head into the office tomorrow. So if any of you guys have any questions before we end it up, 
um, here this evening. Be more than happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, for me, uh, looking forward, uh, would love to get into some Cashflow Chronicles with Mr. Patel this week. Uh, so that should be that would be fun. I need to message him. In fact, while you guys are here and potentially rallying yourself to ask a question, let me see if Mr. Patel would entertain that. Mr. Patel, I'm currently live streaming on a nice Sunday, and I'm curious if I can inquire whether or not you would like to do Cashflow Chronicles on Tuesday. Hopefully your trip to New York was safe. Um, thank you for the due diligence that you put into your Patreon uh, with some of those articles that you put out. Those are really good and helpful. Glad to see we got some good due diligence for the New York market. I'm still holding my SLG, which is up uh, over 100%, and I just got a nice dividend on Friday. But, yes, just inquiring whether or not on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you would love to do a Cashflow Chronicles. Um, thanks, my man. I'll talk to you soon. All right, so there's a nice little 44-second voice message for Mr. Patel. Um, let me see. Thoughts on NVIDIA share price by end of this year? I don't know. Thoughts on Zscaler? I don't know. Uh, did I do any barbecuing this weekend? I did not, and I was actually really upset. Um, Chris going to follow Chapter 11, what? Um, I did not do any barbecuing this weekend. I was actually pretty upset about it. Uh, I wanted to. But I just never got around. Oh, I think. Yes, sir. Let's do it. All right, Mr. Patel is in. So hopefully we'll be able to, to knock out some cash flow chronicles this weekend. Um, but going back to this one, thoughts on NVIDIA shares, man. I don't know. Um, it seems to just keep, keep doing well. Uh, I actually just got done watching um, a stream with Amit and Jose. And apparently they have a, a, a big conference tomorrow. We're really going to be displaying some of the uh, the new functionalities, the new industries for NVIDIA. So that could have a, a big impact on the share price, positively or negatively. Uh, Miss Cashflow Chronicles live streams. I agree. They're a good time. Um, any new thoughts on the Mega Constellation customer for Rocket Lab and the missing money counting for contract? Does NDA make it invisible? Uh I don't know what you mean by missing money. If you could elaborate on that. Any new thoughts on the Mega Constellation customer, Rock Lab, and the missing money? I don't think there's any missing money. Um, I don't know if you're referring to how they ended the year with, you know, uh, a certain amount of money, and then they had all the convertible debt and stuff like that at the beginning of the year, so that won't show up until... Um, this first quarter earnings, which is in May. So not sure if that's what you're referring to, or I'm just confused because sometimes, you know, I'm behind on some of this news. Um, Johnny Mac, welcome, my guy. Hope things are going well. No real questions except when Cashflow Chronicles will be back. Seems like we're get an answer. Yes. Hope. Uh, what's Mr. Patel saying? Or is this... Now he's giving me investment advice. Guess what, Chris? No, I'm just kidding. Um, interviews went well, man. Interviews went well. Too well. Now I got to make what job I'm taking. Um, let's see. Rooting for me. Thank you so much, my man. Yeah, it's, it's it's been good. Things have been extended, we will see. Like, offers have been extended, but uh, I got to figure out everything. Um yeah, sometimes uh, when you have so much opportunity, it, it causes problems. Uh, money was supposed to be in backlog numbers. Oh, got it. I thought you meant like from cash and cash equivalents perspective. Um, sorry, that's where I was confused. Got it. Yeah. We'll see, my man. I think... I'm okay if the backlog number doesn't show up as expected, as long as the revenue does. I know it makes it easier because then they generally state, you know, oh, 40% of this will be realized or 30% of it will be realized, et cetera. Uh, the thing that I think is a little bit more concerning for me is 
they're starting to ramp up so much right now. Like if you were to compare Redwire to Rocket Lab, Redwire's backlog is over three billion versus Rocket Labs is you know just north of a billion. So um anyway, just some just some thoughts with that one. It's Cashflow Chronicles over, dismissed because no episodes in a bit. It's not over. Uh, you know, Chris works full time, I work full time. Uh, one of us gets out of um, out of let's just say order, uh, or goes away for the week. Unfortunately, we miss it. Like it's just me and Chris, right? So I don't want to just like this stream isn't Cashflow Chronicles. This stream is just Maddie Mula uh, after hours on a Sunday night. Just kidding. But um, when you know it's just me and Chris, so if there's a finance junkies episode and Chris can't come, they still will do two out of the three or two out of the four. I mean, or three out of the four and Chris just won't be there. Um, and same thing with like Vitaly, like if Vitaly doesn't has a, an obligation, they'll do the three out of the four. They can still do it versus I don't want to put out a cash flow chronicles that people can go back and look at and really get like a huge education piece. Like this is more of like a one-on-one personal, sort of map money to, to you guys sort of question and answer versus a cash flow chronicles. I want to put like a little bit more oomph and conversation into two, two gentlemen, uh, two distinguished gentlemen um, really going back and forth and, and trying to dive deep into great opportunities that are out in the market. So um, yeah, Chris unfortunately was out of town the majority of last week and I wasn't really prepared for him to be back Thursday. Uh, we we could have we could have done a stream on Thursday, but by the time I realized that Chris was at home, I was just too lazy to set everything up, um, and it would have been delayed, you know, a couple minutes because um, I didn't look at finance chunkies until like ten fifteen minutes before Cash for Chronicles would have started. So uh, I didn't even realize Chris was home. So um, it's no hit. Um, we're just fortunate every time that the stars align and uh, we're able to, to get a um, get an opportunity to, to chat with you guys. Uh, thoughts on end phase. Look, man, I, I think the solar industry is something that's good. I think that to me, you know, it doesn't make sense for folks to really be concerned about, there there's there's a market for it right so i'm not saying this as like a i'm gonna say this which is a blanket statement in general but it's gonna make it seem like you know i don't think that there's any room for residential solar there is room for residential solar it's just for me like i would much rather be given the opportunity to have electricity that comes to me that's entirely green um, I'd rather myself as well, if I were to spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars on getting solar panels installed, or if that was the cost, I'd rather put that twenty to thirty thousand dollars purchasing another home um, or an investment opportunity uh, in the stock market or what have you, uh, rather than putting it into solar panels. Um, to me as well, I think that commercial solar and the growth of commercial solar, um, meaning like there's a lot more economies of scale if you're able to have larger solar farms put together, you know, gigawatt, two gigawatt solar farms. Most of them are 250 to 500 megawatt solar farms, but there's a lot more economies of scale and you're able to install a lot more and it's more optimal, um, better operating expenditures, et cetera. Than if you were to put them on your house. So, I mean, to me, I'm not against solar by any means. In fact, I think it's a good opportunity to to, to transition to that. And I think with with the cost of the, the the actual PV solar panels coming down over time, they've decreased substantially over the past decade in terms of costs. I think with that, you're just going to see more and more commercial solar projects than you are individual um i just think especially in this environment where you're paying seven percent interest rates six percent interest rates this is not feasible for people to do that but that's not to say that certain people are gung-ho for it and i'm i'm you know applaud those people and um you know a couple of the rentals that we looked at buying in new jersey um 
actually had uh, so i'm just cleaning up my desk um actually had some solar panels and so i almost bought a house with some i just didn't end up working out um but to me it's like i'm one of those people it's just like i don't manage my own cloud network i don't if i need gasoline i don't go drill for oil in my backyard um you know i don't I don't have a rainwater system set up so I can have my own drinking water. You know, I don't, I'd rather just bring it on in, you know, and not have to worry about the solar panels on my roof and the construction impacts that it would have associated with, you know, the, the warranty on my roof and God knows what else. Um, I'd rather just purchase the electricity from the utility company and, and call it quits rather than, you know, if my solar panels go down, you know, they had to come out and fix it, etc. But to me, you know, I'd rather invest in like an XR energy, which is more certain. But the end phase piece, you could have higher reward. I just think it's going to be more volatile. Um, I think it's still overpriced, personally, um, unless they can get back to close to where their revenue was. I, I think it's overpriced today. Um, I've been saying that, you know, I, I wasn't surprised when the share price dropped pretty substantially throughout 2023. Um, Chris and I talked about Enphase quite a bit, you know, over the past year. And I don't think either of us were, were very surprised at it. Um, I plan to add more SoFi shares other than my calls. Um, I don't have any money. Uh, all the money that I was expecting to use on buying stocks potentially going to this new real estate purchase. So uh, if that falls through, then I might buy some, some money here and there uh, and just put some money here or there into SoFi. But for now, I just have, um, before I realized I had this potential real estate purchase on the table, which literally happened this morning, late last night, this morning, uh, you know, I, I bought the long calls, which I think were the May, $10 calls. Um, do I think it's going to $10? No, but what I bought them for was a quick reversal back to seven fifty or eight bucks. The value of those contracts will go up by 50 to a hundred percent. And so that was kind of my, my quick thought associated with that is that, you know, you, you, you buy it not for it to go to 10, but for the Delta increase on the, um, on the underlying as it goes up 50 cents to a dollar on the underlying. Uh, Black Sky has been a big loser for you. Do you have any thoughts on their future market cap? Um, I'd say Black Sky right now is getting themselves out of the woods. Um, you know, I think you just double check. How much are you down, though, I guess is the big question. I think I don't know what the answer to that is, but I'm fairly confident that they'll be able to hit a bottom. Uh, they have already hit a bottom, in my opinion. And they'll get to EBITDA positive. Um, will they be a twenty billion dollar company? I don't think so. So I guess that's where you need to do your own kind of thought process and say, Am I twenty percent down? Am I thirty percent down? Am I eighty percent down? If you're eighty percent down, it's going to be tough for the company to four or five x from here um, in within the next couple of years, right? Um, but if it's only like 20% down or 15% down or something like that, I could easily see once this thing goes and, and gets a little bit more EBITDA break even or even EBITDA positive or cash flow positive, a good catalyst to the share price. So I, it really just depends. You can't just be like, it, it's hard for me to, to answer specifics on a general question, right? Um, Snowflake's odds of rebound. I think Snowflake will do okay. Um, I don't think Slootman was the only reason why um, the company has done well. That's down 50% on a position, aka Tesla, and can hold it for the long, long term. Do you double down uh, heavy or look elsewhere? Um. Sorry, I got a message through Airbnb. Down 50%. Um, it really just depends where you think the long-term potential of a company is. I mean, 
Um, and also the size of the position within the portfolio. Um, I mean, to me, being down 50%, I would just kind of like knock that away and just think about the, let's just say you have a $100,000 portfolio and 50% of it is this company. Um, you know, do you think it's, it's going to do really, really well in the future? Or do you think it's going to continue to go down? And I guess it all depends on what you're investing in it for, right? Like if you're investing it for it to be specifically Tesla, the fuel cell, um, battery maker, robot company, it's like, then wait for it to be that, right? I think the problem that Tesla has, it kind of has an identity crisis, with it being a, a car company with inflated margins to which everyone thought that the margins were going to stay at 30% forever. Now that's no longer the case. Um, you know, net margins have come down pretty substantially and now it's kind of being compared to say normal traditional automakers, but yet the other parts of their business is too, too much in its infancy. Now people are sitting there saying, Oh, but their energy business grew 300%. Okay. Well, like, I could save $1 tomorrow and then next year I could save $5 and I've now saved 500% year over year. Right. Um, I think a lot of people don't recognize when they say six gigawatt hours, right. Of energy storage. Now it might be a quarter or so old, but just thinking about that, there's other businesses next to our energy, for example, that make 28 gigawatt hours per hour. Right. And you're talking about an entire quarter to make six gigawatt hours. So they made one quarter uh, of the energy output of Nextera and in, in, in an entire quarter that Nextera Energy makes in about six hours. So, uh, you know, you're talking about a large difference of. Uh, uh, of of output. So I guess it really just depends when you think of them as an energy company. Are they really the energy company that you really think they are? Are they really the robotics company? I think that, you know, the robotics piece will do really well. Um, and so I'm, I'm personally intrigued by if I can get in at a decent price, probably closer to a hundred bucks, I would con con uh, contemplate entering a position. But with where it's at right now, that there's hair on that, right? I mean, I know that they have robots that work, but there's still hair on it, regulatory, et cetera, that causes some some scariness. Um, so I, I don't know. But I personally uh, think that there's more downside to Tesla to come. But then again, um, and this is complete transparency, you know, I've I've missed the boat on Tesla for quite some time. So I've almost invested in it once. And um, had I did, I would be up, you know, a couple hundred percent on it because uh, I was going to invest in it at the depths of the pandemic, March of 2020. Um, and my buy order was 10 cents off. So I didn't end up buying it. So... Uh, I don't have an answer for you, but uh, yeah. Your black sky average is about six bucks. Well, I don't know what to tell you there, my my friend. Uh, you can either average down. I also don't know how big your position size is, right? Like you could have 100 shares, right? And if that's the case, then you could easily average yourself down. You know, I don't know if you have 100 shares or if you have 100,000 shares. Um, tough, tough to say. What do you think of the price target for Palantir? I think it'll stay around 25, 26 bucks. I think it's going to grow into it. Do I think it'll have spikes up to 30 bucks? I do. do. I think it'll drop down to 20 bucks. I do. But I think we'll end the year at about 25 bucks. What are your favorite numbers to look at when judging a tech company like software? I wanted to ask which metrics are your favorites for all stocks. It definitely depends on the industry. It also depends on the maturity of the stock. Um, so if your company doesn't have a price to earnings ratio, it's pretty hard to compare 
it against Google, which has a price to earnings ratio. So it really just depends. Um, you know, what's the total addressable market? Where do you think it's going to go? What do you think the long-term potential output of the company is going to be? To me, when I look at Palantir, I see a company that's going to create really high net margins on the order of previously I used to think 25, 30%. Now I'm thinking closer to 45 to 50%. It's based off of recent knowledge, but whether that's true, I don't know. So then you start to think, well, how much could the revenue be? Well, the revenue could be, um, let's say $10 billion in whatever time. And you start to, you start to analyze what you think the future cash flows of the organization might be. You could be completely wrong, but at least gets you in a magnitude as to where you think it's going to go. Um, Versus some people that may be like, like um, intuitive machines, for example, very hard to evaluate a company like that because they've literally only created one vehicle, um, you know, and it was at one point rated a 750 to a billion dollar company, 750 million to a billion dollar company. Very hard to kind of state, well, is that, is that good or bad? Um, and, you know, the same reason why I like Rocket Lab so much is because I think that they're not far behind a SpaceX when it comes to what they've done with their Falcon 9. I think that Rock Lab is not too far behind that. Um, the company's worth $2 billion um, versus SpaceX being worth $200 billion. So in terms of revenue, you know, the revenue is not off that. Like, you know, SpaceX made $8.6 billion of revenue last year. They're a $200 billion company. So their price of sales is in the 20s. Versus a rocket lab is being punished right now, and the price of sales is only a five. So it makes you think a little bit. Like one of two things has to happen: either SpaceX's price of sales has to come down, or Rocket Lab's price of sales need to expand. We also have to think the margins for SpaceX might be better, and that's why they're ranking. You know, they might be fifty percent better, a hundred percent better than what you have at say a Rocket Lab. So if that's the case. Maybe that's a reason why the net margin um, or the price of sales is so awful uh, for Rocket Lab. So you got to think a little bit. Um, but it really just depends. You know, you can't, for example, you can't compare Google to Palantir in terms of price to earnings. Um, but one thing I would look at is where do you think the company's going? What's it trading at? For example, you know, if you look at Palantir, what's it trading at and from a price to earnings ratio? Right now, it's going to be extremely high because they're just offsetting their operating expenditures. But a couple of years down the road, you know, let's just say 2027, for example, if you get an idea as to what the, the free cash flow of the business might be, then you can kind of look and say, well, I think in 2027, 2028, it's going to be making, I don't know, $2 billion of free cash. If that's the case, then you have a price to free cash of, let's just say, close to 30 right now. That's pretty cheap. Um, for a company that's going to continue to grow. And if you think you're like, well, what 2030, they're going to be making free cash flow of about four and a half to $5 billion. And it's like, well, the company's worth 60 billion right now. So do you think it's worth 60 billion when in five, 10 years down the road, it's going to be making four and a half, $5 billion in free cash. So it's really up to you, right? And whether you think that that's appropriate or not, compared to analogs, compared to whatever you want, but you know, it's going to be hard. Because even if you try to compare Apple to Google to Google to Amazon, they're all in different industries per se. But another thing is also its growth period as well. I mean, if you have Microsoft that's growing at 30% per annum and their net margins are staying flat, then it trading at a 30 PE is not that big of a deal because going back to where it's at, let's just say $100 billion in, in net income, let's just say in 2024. Well, if it grows 30% per annum, for the next two to three years, well, in let's just say three years' time, it's going to be making two hundred billion dollars in net income. So it might have been trading at a thirty x price to earnings ratio when it was making a hundred billion, um, meaning that it was trading at a three trillion dollar market cap, right? Um, but if it's making two hundred billion dollars um, in let's just say three years. Then currently it's valued at 300, uh, sorry, $3 trillion. 
and you divide that now by the two hundred billion dollars. So it's trading at a price to let's just say earnings of fifteen times for twenty twenty seven, and you're sitting there being like, well, shit, you know, what's appropriate? Is twenty appropriate? Is is trading it at a thirty five x price to earnings ratio for twenty twenty four earnings appropriate? Um, it also depends on the macroeconomic environment. Nothing's perfect, and that's and that's when you like when you start stacking a lot of these things on top of each other. Um, net income margin, revenue growth, etc. Let's say Palantir comes in at zero percent growth for next year. You're like, well, they're not getting to ten billion by 2032, so why would I value them so so high at sixty billion dollars if they're not going to grow, right? And that's when you see these companies, um, you see these companies drop, you know, twenty percent overnight. It's because they reforecast and their net margin is not as good as what they thought. Their growth was not as good as what they thought. Um, string cheese, by the way, it's way better when it's when it's warm. Um, way down on 3M, 20% for now for months and months. 3M is 3.5% in your portfolio. Do you average down? Or just wait and see what happens. Dude, I don't know what your objectives are. Is it income? Is it total return? Um, it's total return. I guess you got to ask yourself: Do you think 3M is going to double, triple, um, comparatively to say some of its counterparts? Are you looking for stability in the portfolio? I guess it all just really depends on what you're looking for. Um, you know, I used to be somebody that was very much focused on not losing money, right, and getting dividends in the portfolio and and things of the like. Um, and the more well off I get, the more money I save the more aggressive I'm willing to be with the portfolio. That's why I've more so aimed towards growth and and things like that because, you know, I can afford to lose, let's just say, 50% of my portfolio and still be ahead of a lot of my peers. So um, that's just my my kind of thought process. So I just would ask yourself, you know, what's the objective of the, the position? Um, did you just put money into it to put money into it or – do you honestly think it's going to go somewhere, um, or it's or there's three M's, or three M's glory days behind it? You know that's also plausible. Um, kind of keep that in mind. I don't know. I don't have the answer for you. I don't know what your objectives are for your portfolio, so I'm not trying to belittle it or talk poorly about it. If you're looking for dividend income, I think you'll be okay with a three M dividend income, but. Um, you could also try writing cover calls a little bit um, to garner a little bit of that 20% back. But for me, I sold 3M a long time ago because it, it didn't no, it no longer met my investment objectives. This was like 2020, something like that. I stopped focusing on dividend income. I started focusing more on growth, and that's when I sold 3M. Tesla to drop 100 to 120 bucks? I think so. Why wouldn't it? Tell me why Tesla can trade at a price to earnings ratio of 40 when a Ford and GM trade at a, a fraction when they start now having the same net margin. All right? Keep in mind, yes, I understand. Oh, but it's not just a car company. It's like, but. When 95% of your revenues bark like a dog, talk like a dog, fart like a dog, eat like a dog, it's a dog. Um, not saying the stock is a dog, but I'm just saying, you know, it's it makes cars. 95% of its revenues come from cars. Um, it's a car company. Sorry. So why is it trading any different? I've always thought that. And then... That's why I've been burned by the company for so long, but I think now it's actually coming to reality now that the margins are kind of coming down into reality. Um, do I think that's worth two and a half times what Toyota's worth? They make the same net income probably, about. So... Um, no idea what TMDX is. What stock are you speaking about? And I'd rather buy HPE than any tech stocks. Uh, I don't know. I've talked about a lot of stocks. 
What do I think of PayPal? I can see where people invest in it. I wish my friends that invest in PayPal well. I think it's going to be a turnaround story for them. To me, unless they do something very innovative with the company, I've used the product. The product has burned me in the past. Um, it's burned other friends that I know more recently in the past few quarters. Um, so not from a stock perspective, but just the actual product itself. So this is... It's a no for me, man. Um, but I wish my friends well that invested in it. I, I see the potential for it to kick back to growth. I mean, they're going to buy back a lot of stock. That in its own is going to be helpful um, to, to put a floor on the company uh, share price. But, you know, I'd rather put my money into something that's actually going to grow um, fundamentally and, and not have so much, um, has more of a moat, let's say. Versus PayPal, I don't really think has much of a moat. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Did if you did buy it into it for dividends, buybacks, do you think it's going to triple in value for 3M? I mean, I don't know what what you did, but it's the same reason why I just sold Pepsi, right? I sold Pepsi to buy into SoPi. It's like I love Pepsi, but I was up 100% on the stock, or close to it, maybe not 100%. Um, but I was probably up, I don't know, at least 60%, 70% or something on the stock. And I had a bunch of reinvested dividends and I was like, okay, Pepsi's great, but it's like a $250 billion company. I'm like, do I really see Pepsi going to $500 billion? Or do I see SoFi going from 8 billion to, to 16 billion? And so I sat there and I said, I love Pepsi. You know, I love their products, Frito, Doritos. Pepsi, Gatorade, etc. Love that shit. But when it comes to money being money, what I think is more likely, and I think the likelihood of SoFi going from eight bucks or whatever that I bought it at to 16 bucks is more likely than a Pepsi going from whatever it was, 170 or something when I sold it to 340 bucks. Um, you know, I think, do I think Pepsi's glory days are behind it? No. Was it kind of overvalued here? I think Pepsi was a little overvalued here. So the really the thing that I saw was it was more downside than upside and it can grow into its valuation, but I don't think it was appropriately valued. I think it was overvalued where it was. And so sell high, buy low. And I think SoFi is low right now. So uh, I think it's a good store of capital, which is why I also sold Orsted. I think Orsted, I was up 30 something percent. And the growth story has changed a little bit at Orsted. They're pulling back a little bit and focusing more on returns to investors and rather than all out growth. And um, the company pivoted a little bit and, you know, it's already up 30, 40% or something. I don't remember what it was exactly, but it's already up a little bit on the stock. So I said, all right, well, I'm going to sell that. It's got to grow into that valuation a little bit anyway. Um, I'll, invest my money into SoFi. It's more guaranteed to double than Orsted is right now. It's more guaranteed to double than Pepsi is right now. And that's all it is. It's really a game of doubling. And um, that's all I, I took the opportunity to do. Um, I don't want to talk too much about NEXT. Um, I mean, we've talked about it at length on multiple Cashflow Chronicles episodes. So be sure to go check it out. Uh, the link for Cashflow Chronicles um, channel and all the episodes is is in the link in the description below. But uh, yeah, I mean, NEXT, it's probably one of the only um, remaining LNG plants that's strictly um, strictly a company. So there's that in Tellurian, but NEXT has actually sanctioned their project versus Tellurian's project isn't necessarily sanctioned yet. It's approved, but is it sanctioned by the company? The answer is no. So if you think about it, all these other companies, um, whether it's Shell, Exxon, Total, um, they're all upstream businesses as a whole. This is like, NEXT is its own project, right? So all you're looking at is what do you think it's going to discounted cash flow in the future? 
because that can be used to pay down debt. It can be used to give out dividends, etc. And so that's all you're looking for is how much ownership, how much guaranteed is it going to be coming into play? If I buy it for a billion dollars, is it going to distribute? How much is it going to distribute? Um, that's really what you're looking for. Um, does it have the ability to, to actually export the gas? Does it have the people and customers that are going to help pay for it? That's all it really is. Um, how large of a position? Uh, it's 9,100 shares right now. And by the end of next week, uh, this week rather, it'll be closer to 13,000 shares. And then hopefully within the next couple months, it'll be 15 or so thousand. Um, Next is up 18%. I think the big catalyst for next um, in the shorter term is they have their phase one facility already FID'd, financial investment decision, final investment decision, sorry. So that means shovels are in the ground, they're building it, et cetera. They haven't FID'd the second phase, and they own way more of the second phase. I think they own 60%, 50 60% of the second phase of the project. They only own like, I don't know, 20% or something of the first phase of the project. Um, so while they'll operate, they'll be able to get a little bit of money from operating it, et cetera. Uh, obviously, they, they have ownership as well. Um, but when you think about it, the, the big piece for NEXT is really going to be the second phase of the project because if they're able to come up with the capital, to build the second phase of the project, then um, that's where they'll have a lot of money kind of coming in the door because um, they'll own, you know, 50% of it. The first phase is partly owned by Total. It's partly owned by um, uh, uh, a Middle Eastern uh, investment fund. So... I don't know anything about Rumble, man. That's where you come in. Uh, Junebug, welcome to the stream. Uh, did you miss to become rich? You're already rich, Junebug. You're the myth, the legend. Uh, but anyway, um, I didn't expect to go on for an hour, so I'm going to try to play a few games um, before um, and then get get myself prepared for the rest of the week. But hopefully that was nice and insightful for you guys. I'm really interested. I think Bitcoin will be an interesting one. Um, I know a lot of people are kind of like iffy, 50-50. But I think Bitcoin will be one that really surprises people over the next 12 to 18 months. So I think that'll be fun. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. Any interesting companies? I mean, uh, the first half was really the companies I'm focusing on right now, um, the top seven positions in the portfolio. Uh, those are the ones I'm really focusing on right now. Um, so I'm trying to think if there's really anything else. Um, yeah, you guys rock. Sorry, I'm, I'm starting to get a little sleepy, so uh, this cheese is getting after me. But hopefully this was insightful for you guys. Hopefully we will come back this week stronger and better than ever with Mr. Patel on Tuesday through Thursday with Cashflow Chronicles. If you guys have uh, not been on the streaming channel as of yet, the link is in the description. We're about to get to 1,000 subscribers over there, and we'll be able to monetize and move over fully decoupling the Matt Money and Cashflow Chronicles brand. Cashflow Chronicles will be its own separate brand at that point, and it'll be 50-50 me and Mr. Patel. So hopefully we can get there sooner rather than later. But as always, you guys rock and uh, don't do anything I would not do um, because I've done some shit. And to answer this one specifically, the only reason why I have my money in GBTC is because I've owned it since 2020 and I bought 450% in a lot of those shares that I bought. So it doesn't make sense for me to sell, take the tax event because it's in a taxable account and then move it over into a lower expense ratio. Um, sort of ETF. So um, that's the only reason why I'm in a different one. 
I think they're all going to be rather similar. Just choose an institution that you trust. Um, you know, if you trust Fidelity, use Fidelity. If you trust BlackRock, choose BlackRock, etc. cetera. Um, but that's the only reason why I'm on GPTC, which is the highest of the expense ratios, because otherwise I'd have to, you know, pay taxes on long-term capital gains on a lot of uh, gains. And I just think that, you know, that 1% um, in the short term is okay. Um, and then if I do end up selling a portion of it, uh, I'll probably buy back in uh, to one of the other funds because uh, I think we're going to be in a peak here within the next 12 to 18 months. So if I do sell, it'll be because we're at a peak and I plan on buying in uh, in a different fund. So anyway, final thoughts on that and I'll uh, talk to you guys soon. Cheers.